My name is Arnold Zabel. I'm the president of uh, Melbourne Pen, and uh, I'd like to welcome you here firstly. And secondly, we're going to spend five minutes uh, on something uh, a little bit different. Uh, when we planned this event, uh, we couldn't foresee, because the other event was uh, um, planned a little bit later, that it would coincide with a worldwide reading which is taking place today organised by the uh, Berlin International Liter Literature Festival um, on behalf of uh, Li Xiaobo, the Chinese dissident who won the Nobel Peace Prize last year and is still incarcerated. And so we thought that the way we'd honour the the occasion is to to read the poem which is being uh, read worldwide today uh, and then we uh, have joined forces with the Melbourne Writers Festival and I'll introduce Jenny in a moment uh, and so this will be our contribution and this there, there are organizations pen centers around the world as well as other individuals and literary organisations that are taking part. So it's a fabulous event. Uh, these events make a difference. Um, uh, Jenny will say a bit more about it. Uh, I'll just read the following. Uh, this was put out by the International Literature Festival of Berlin. Liu Xiaobo is currently the world's only winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, still held in detention. In 2009, after co-authoring Charter 08, a manifesto calling for greater freedoms and democracy in China, Liu Xiaobo was sentenced to 11 years in prison on a spurious charge of inciting subversion of state power. His continued imprisonment is a basic breach of human rights and also a violation of China's own constitution where Article 35 states that citizens of the People's Republic of China enjoy freedom of speech, of the press, of assembly, of association, of procession and of demonstration. 1936 was the last time neither the winner, German journalist and pacifist Karl von Ossietzky, nor any of his family members could go to Oslo to collect the Nobel Peace Prize. They were all barred from leaving Nazi Germany. This historical comparison should disturb the Chinese government. And it's quite disturbing, isn't it, to, to think that uh, there is this link. And so uh, both Melbourne Pen and the Melbourne Writers Festival are passionate about this issue and about the issue of the persecution of writers uh, in general. So it gives me pleasure to introduce Jenny Nevin, who is the uh, program coordinator for the Melbourne Writers Festival, and she will say a few more words about the reading and read the poem. Hi there, thank you all for coming out on such a lovely sunny day. Um, uh, as Arnold says, I'm Jenny Niven. I'm uh, the program manager at the Melbourne Writers' Festival, um, and we enjoy a, a lovely association with the Berlin International Literature Festival. Um, both of our festivals are part of a world alliance um, of six inters and six and growing international uh, literary festivals, um, and we were very pleased to be extended the invitation to take part um, in this worldwide reading today. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes of your time to consider Liu Xiaobo, the Chinese poet and activist who last year, as Arnold said, won the Nobel Peace Prize for his campaigns for democracy and freedom of expression in China. He's still in detention today, serving an 11-year sentence. His wife, Liu Jia, continues to be held under house arrest. Today, around the world, individuals, literary organisations and cultural institutions are coming together to show support and solidarity for Liu Xiaobo. More than 100 165 organisations in 33 countries will hold an event like this one today uh, and share Leo Xiaobo's poem, You Wait For Me With Dust. And because we're in Australia, we're one of the first to do it, which is nice. <laughs> the preamble uh, to Leo Xiaobo's Charter 8, um, which kind of sparked the beginning of this um, this house arrest for, uh, and detention for him. Um, in Charter 8, he states that Chinese citizens are becoming increasingly aware that freedom, equality and human rights are universal values shared by all humankind 
and that democracy, republicanism and constitutional government make up the basic institutional framework of modern politics. A moderni modernization bereft of these universal values and this basic political framework is a disastrous process that deprives people of their rights, rots away their humanity and destroys their dignity. Where is, where is China headed in the 21st century? Will it continue with this modernization under authoritarian rule, or will it endorse universal values, join the mainstream civilization, and build a democratic form of government? The call for worldwide readings of Charter 8 and Liu Xiaobo's poem, You Wait for Me with Dust, signify support for the campaigner and a call for his release from prison. A courageous activist all of his life, Liu Xiaobo once wrote that in a dict dictatorial country, open letters signed by individuals or groups form an important method for the civilians to resist dictatorship and fight for freedom. And so we citizens of the world sign this appeal, voice this appeal today, um, some with our names and many, many more across the world today with our voices, um, raised today, 20th of March 2011, to read Leo's words and show solidarity with him, his wife and others in China who are not free to say what they want. We'll continue to speak up until there's an end to the unjust incarceration of Liu Xiaobo and others like him. If you'd like to attach your name to this um, petition, you can go onto the, the website for the International Berlin Literary Festival um, and sign your name there, there. And you can also, of course, if you haven't already, join Penn um, to support the very valuable work um, that they do. So to conclude, I'd like to read for you um, You Wait For Me With Dust, um, Liu, Xiaobo's, um, Liu Xiaobo's poem, which was translated by Shung Danyi, Shirley Lee, and Martin Alexander. Um, and he's made it available, his family <laughs> have made it available um, for people to read around the world today. Um, and the poem is dedicated for his, uh, to his wife, who waits every day. You Wait For Me With Dust, Liu Xiaobo. Nothing remains in your name, nothing, but to wait for me, together with the dust of our home, those layers amassed, overflowing in every corner. You're unwilling to pull apart the curtains and let the light disturb their stillness. Over the bookshelf, the handwritten label is covered in dust. On the carpet, the pattern inhales the dust. When you are writing a letter to me and love that the nibs tipped with dust, my eyes are stabbed with pain. You sit there all day long, not daring to move, for fear that your footsteps will trample the dust. You try to control your breathing, using silence to write a story. At times like this, the suffocating dust offers the only loyalty. Your vision, breath, and time permeate the dust. In the depth of your soul, the tomb, inch by inch, is piled up from the feet, reaching the chest, reaching the throat. You know that the tomb is your best resting place, waiting for me there, with no source of fear or alarm. This is why you prefer dust in the dark, in calm suffocation, waiting for me, you wait for me with dust. Refusing the sunlight and movement of air, just let the dust bury you altogether. Just let yourself fall asleep in the dust until I return and you come awake, wiping the dust from your skin and your soul. What a miracle, back from the dead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. So that's an extraordinary moving poem. I think it not only represents Liu Xiaobo, but I think it represents uh, the way writers who are currently in prison in many countries would feel uh, that sense of being apart from their loved ones. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Vice President, Judy Buckridge, who will uh, introduce this afternoon's event. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming on such a beautiful day. Um, this event was really planned as part of the International Women's Day commemorations. Um, Melbourne Penn Centre has held something on or, on or around International Women's Day for many years now, and especially since I became the chair of the Women Writers Committee of Penn, which I no longer am, but um, for six years I held that position and met many writers, women writers throughout the world. Um, 
it also is a time for us to think about all the women writers, all the women journalists, especially in the Middle East, um, especially today as the bombs are being dropped on Libya. Um, all of the terrible things that have happened, there have been many uh, journalists and particularly women journalists um, kind of isolated and raped, etc. during this, this period of unrest in that region and of course before that too. Um, so really I'm very pleased to introduce Deb Verhoeven who um, will talk about some of these, particularly one of, one of the filmmakers from that region in her talk. Um, Deb is Chair and Professor of Media and Communication at Deakin University. She is the Deputy Chair of the National Film and Sound Archive, President of the online film journal Senses of Cinema, and Honorary Life Member of Women in Film and Television. Deb is an active film critic and member of the Australian Film Critics Association and the Fédération Internationale de la Presse Cinématographique. And she appears as a regular commentator on industry developments in the Australian media. She's the author of Sheep and the Australian Cinema and the recent monograph Jane Campion. She's currently co-authoring a book titled The New Cinema History Guide, which argues that cinema history must better acknowledge the role that cinema plays in culture at large by concerning itself less with individual text and more with the social context and function of cinema going. Um, after Deb, Deb will uh, speak and then after Deb has finished speaking, um, Cynthia Troop and Deb will actually engage in a, a Q&A. So thank you very much, um, Deb. Hi everyone, thanks again for coming out on a, a lovely sunny day. I know the, um, myself, the pressure that uh, the sun brings with it. <laughs> Let alone the full moon last night. Did anyone see that? That was just extraordinary. Um, and thank you, Judith. And I, I particularly want to thank Penn for inviting me to do this event because um, I'm by trade a film historian and I'm a film historian at a very interesting time in film history. It's a time when film actually looks like it's going to be history. Um, and so this kind of adds a, a philosophical dimension to what I do on a, a fairly daily basis in, in my work life. Um, this event enabled me or gave me the opportunity to reconnect to aspects of my own history, both as an academic and as an activist. And I might just, if I just bring this up. <coughs> Uh, this is a, a poster of an event that I ran in the late 1980s called Film... The, the organisation was called Film Fatale, and it was a, three years of, of film screenings of women's films. I can see Kay rec remembers those screenings. Um, and, it, and we titled our poster, She Must Be Seeing Things. It's where the title for today's talk came from. Um, and this was, a, I think, one of the, the very earliest of the, the kind of curated um, uh, women's-only events that, that occurred in Melbourne. I think there had been one previous Women's Film Festival some years earlier. Um, and it was a, an enormous success, um, much to, to everyone's great surprise and relief. Um, and we used to do things like we'd um, serve anti-Anzac Day biscuits instead, instead of Anzac biscuits every <laughs> at the refreshment counter and things like that. So we kind of had a bit of fun about it as well. Um, so it's given, this, this talk's really given me an opportunity to go back and think about some of my, my early activism and, and what the foundational, um, I guess, basis for my thinking, thinking through being in the film industry happens to be. It, this event's also enabled me to think outside what's a fairly typical division within the academy around the way these things are debated. Women's authorship in the academy is normally debated in terms of uh, whether you're, as an academic, pro or anti-essentialist. Okay. So do women just simply make different films because they're women or are there other factors that come into play? And that, that debate kind of really bogged things down for a long time and consequently you'll find there hasn't been very much writing around women's cinema for a long time. Um, and this event has really crystallised for me ways in which we can start talking about these things again without having to get bogged down in that and I kind of hope that comes out as, as I start to talk. Um, and finally, um, as in this event's title, um, this event's really uh, introduced me to new ways of seeing 
and has challenged my own academic focus on cinema going as distinct from authorship in very unexpected and quite philosophical ways. And I hope again, as we go through some of the, the case studies in the talk, you'll see that a bit more clearly. I'm not going to abandon the, the actual topic, but I do want to explore this particular angle I have in relation to the study of cinema, which is this idea that the context in which cinema circulates is often just as important as the content of individual films themselves. And that's, that's really where I'm going to be coming from with a, a lot of today's talk. So. Um, I thought what I'll do is I'll structure the talk around uh, several women who for one reason or another have been fashioned, often willingly, as outsiders in relation to their work in their various film industries. They span different locations, they come from different periods of film history, um, they go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, my intention is not to suggest that they're in any way deliberately linked, but I think as we talk about them we might find links between them, or, or when I talk later to Cynthia we might speculate about some of the links. Um, and I'm going to start with the clip that inspired this talk, um, which is uh, a clip by the journalist, uh, and I'm never going to do the Arabic justice, but Wajaya al -Huayda. Um This is a, a, a fairly short clip, and I'm going to show lots of clips throughout the course of the talk, so you can relax, I'm not going to talk too much. Um, it was made in 2008 uh, to celebrate International Women's Day. Um, and I note um, around that same time, uh, a new annual celebration also began. So uh, this year is the 100th anniversary, I think, of International Women's Day, is that right? And um, a few years ago, a new day um, of celebration or, or consternation occurs on the 12th of March, which is the World Day Against Internet Censorship. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that once we've finished with the clip. Okay, so that's a very short little clip um, advocating uh, the right to drive for women in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I love that clip, and I love it for a number of reasons, which I want to talk about in a minute, but just some context. <clears throat> The World Economic Forum uh, in 2009, just after this clip was made, ranked Saudi Arabia 130 out of 134 countries for gender parity. It was the only country to score a zero in the category of political empowerment. The only country. And can you imagine the scale? Um, women cannot vote or be elected to high political positions in Saudi Arabia. And um, as noted in this, nor can they drive. Um, and in 2008, there was a, a huge movement around the right to drive, um, s spawned in part by this YouTube clip. Um, a thousand signatures were gathered and, and sent to um, the, the government. Um, and of course, almost nothing came of it. Um, the interesting thing to me is that um, as an activist, um, Wajeha um, hasn't been censured for this clip in particular. Okay? She has been censured for a number of other acts um, including holding banners up um, on busy roads and, and all sorts of other things that she's done. Um, she, uh, for a very long time, used to travel to the border um, to try and um, leave Saudi Arabia without signed permission from a male guardian. And she would do that every day, only to be returned every day um, in a kind of you know, Groundhog Day kind of gesture. Um, <clears throat> and so on. The YouTube clip d didn't appear to be especially threatening to the government for reasons which we might speculate about later. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with where internet technology was in 2008 at that time. And, and I'll show you some stats in a minute. The reason I really like the clip, um, in part, you can see in this um, college student's statement, I would like to drive. Here, the woman cannot drive. She means here in Saudi Arabia. And I would like here to have a cinema, a movie. I would like to be free. All people want to be free. One of the interesting things also about Saudi Arabia, not only can't you drive if you're a woman, there are no cinemas. Okay? There are no cinemas in Saudi Arabia. So one of the only reasons for that last clip existing in YouTube is because it can't be shown any other way. Um, it could be shown by being emailed or by being put onto a disc um, or by being put up onto the internet, but it couldn't, can't be shown in a cinema in Saudi Arabia. Um, <clears throat> instead, Saudi Arabians who want to watch films in a cinema have to drive 500 kilometres to Bahrain, um, which they do quite regularly. Um, and so during the holiday season, something like 80 to 90 per cent of cinemas in Bahrain are filled with Saudi Arabians watching movies. 
Okay. So there's something intimately interconnected between driving and cinema <laughs> in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> which I kind of like. <laughs> um, the driving interview, that, in, that thing that is shot of someone driving while they're being interviewed, is a bit of a documentary staple. You've probably all seen it on 60 Minutes. Um, often it's, it's used in a way that's completely superfluous to the story at hand. You know, someone's driving along talking about a completely different topic to actually what they're doing. Um, and, and you also see it, um, another version of that in the, the kind of walk and talk that you see in documentaries where, you know, the, the interviewer sort of walks toward the camera like this as they um, that's, that's partly to capture the sense that you're watching a moving image document, okay? You're not listening to the radio, you're not reading something, you're watching a movie. So the idea is to get movement inside the frame. Um, the driving interview is similar. So it's a, a way of creating some movement. Here, however, in this instance, the moving image itself is like a microcosm for the topic of the film, which is, you know, movement for Saudi women. How can Saudi women get to move? How do they get... And, you know, I think this is a really kind of crucial question for understanding the, the right to drive movement. Um, in Saudi Arabia, it's this, this idea that it's not just... Um, a metaphor, it's literal. In Australia we have Gilardisms where we're all moving forward. Um, in Saudi Arabia, you know, people just want to, you know, women just want to get in a car and be able to drive themselves. And, th and this is, you know, something we, I guess, take for granted here. Um, and the other reason I really like the clip is it, as a, a kind of feminist film historian, it's got a little bit Thelma and Louise about it. Um, and you, know, you can't think about women in road movies without vaguely thinking about Thelma Lloyd's. Hopefully it has a happier ending. Um, I promise there won't be any more Gillardisms. There also won't be any um, Australian idolisms. You know, I'm on a journey. <clears throat> okay, I think I, I just absolutely love that, that clip. It does a lot with a little. Um, let's think a little bit about internet access in Saudi Arabia. At the time that clip was made, only 30% of Saudi Arabians had internet access. Um, however, what's, what is interesting to know about in relation to new technologies in Saudi Arabia is that gender segregation has in fact produced enormous enthusiasm for uh, innovative communications technologies so that Saudi Arabians, for example, were amongst the earliest adopters of Bluetooth because it enables surreptitious communication between men and women that wouldn't otherwise be allowed. So a lot of these new technologies that allow you to have virtual lives or disguised lives are very um, taken up with great enthusiasm in Saudi Arabia. Saudi women also use online social networking as a way to share ideas. Um, and I think uh, Facebook, in that sense, has also been incredibly useful. According to Facebook itself, there are about 2.5 million Facebook users in Saudi Arabia. Um, in a population of about 26 million, so you know, just under 10%. Um, there's no broadband, it's all ADSL, um, and there's a monopoly on telecommunications provisions. So um, uh, what you find is actually that graph, as we get closer to 2011, has inclined um, commensurately. So we're now looking at a much larger percentage of the percentage of the population having access to the internet, and the government has now started to crack down. So uh, earlier this year, in 2011, um, the government has set up new laws, which apply to anyone who wants to set up a website, blog, personal internet site, distribution list, electronic archive, or chat room, you have to be registered. Uh, so there's no anonymity guaranteed anymore um, in relation to accessing the web. <clears throat> I did want to show you one Facebook page. This is a, a ripper. Um, in 2010, a woman launched a Facebook page to protest against the ban prohibiting women from working in lingerie shops. She succeeded in winning 10,000 supporters. And this is the kind of thing that, of course, the government is now increasingly taking a dim view of. Um, the net has provided Saudi women who now represent more than half the country's bloggers and internet users with unprecedented space in which to express themselves. Um, I think the driving clip that we saw earlier probably was well-timed in 2008. I don't think the government was quite as cluey about the power of the internet at that point. I suspect if it were relaunched now, there might be um, more of a kind of oversight of that sort of activity. Um, so earlier I said that it's not possible to go to the cinema in Saudi Arabia, but it is possible clearly then to make a film. 
Okay, so here we have a paradoxical situation. Here's a country where it's easier to make a film than to actually open a cinema. Um, usually you, th you think of this as being the reverse. <coughs> this brings me to what I want to kind of take up as the theme then for this talk, which is women, mobility and movies. Five case studies, we've done one. We'll move quickly along to the second. Um, Haifa Al-Mansur uh, is the director of a, a film called Women Without Shadows. Um, she is a filmmaker in a country without cinemas, a feature filmmaker. This is, this is providing me with enormous now um, basis for rethinking the whole, um, my whole approach to cinema studies because you know, up until now I have simply assumed that um, cinema, cinema is a, an integrated activity, it's an, an activity that involves the production of films and the consumption of films and those two things have to occur together. You know, you can't, does a tree fall in the forest if there's no one there to hear it? If you make a film and no one watches it, have you really made a film, right? These are, these are kind of fundamental quest, philosophical questions. So if you are a filmmaker in a country without cinemas, what kind of filmmaker are you? Um, and what does that mean about what you're doing? And I think it, it asks us to rethink authorship and rethink the question of what it means to be a filmmaker because it is now possible, I believe, and, and I touched on this in my book about Jane Campion, it is possible because of this, the sense of anticipation around the position of the author, around being a female director in a country without cinemas, uh, which Haifa al is, it is now possible to have a reputation for being a filmmaker without necessarily having made many films or without your films having been seen, okay? Um, so authorship suddenly becomes a function of anticipation, of context, of all the stuff that happens around the film that may or may not exist. <coughs> Weird. <clears throat> Let's listen to her because she has, um, a, I think, a quite interesting uh, view, like I do, on what it means to be a filmmaker. She says um, she actually has shot some footage inside Saudi Arabia, which um, is unusual. Most Saudi filmmakers, and there are a handful of them, tend to make their films in Bahrain or Abu Dhabi or other neighbouring countries. Um, I just thought I'd quote, she says, I want to tell the story of my country and I want to film in my country. Of course, when I'm out on the streets, I'm very cautious and I try to avoid filming out in the open. The police are around every corner and they monitor what is going on. No scenes in bedrooms, no sex scenes, no religion. Um, my films are about women and how they live inside and outside of their homes, their veils and their careers. Um, and she also goes on to criticise the, the government. She says, the ruling religious elite are convinced that film is an immoral medium and they believe that films can corrupt the pure and unblemished Saudi society, which is, of course, completely wrong. They have no idea what film actually is and their understanding of art is extremely limited. They actually believe that if the ban on film is lifted, then everyone will watch nothing but porn. And maybe that's why they're now looking at the internet as well. Um, now, Haifa is a, a really interesting figure because she's actually had an extraordinary international career and, in fact, um, up until quite recently lived in Australia, lived in Sydney uh, for a couple of years. Um, and if you do a, a quick search on her on the internet, you'll discover that she's got an, a very um, significant profile travelling through the festival circuits and so on to... to um, communicate her vision for herself as a filmmaker who hasn't yet really made a film, uh, except these three short films and a documentary. Um, and she proposed a, a film that she would like to make based on, it's actually based on an anecdote she tells about something that happened to her as a child. Um, so this is the, the episode she recounts in a, an interview. Um, when I was little, my brothers wanted bicycles and my father took me along as all of us were to get one. However, the man selling the bicycles refused to sell one to me. With an air of complete disbelief at being asked, he said to my father, but she's a girl. Fortunately, my father was determined to treat us equally, so I got my bike. This freedom did, however, come with limitations. I couldn't cycle in the street as this was too dangerous for girls. I used my bicycle in the house and this in itself embodied my family's rebellion against the suppressive structure of Saudi Arabian society. So she got her bike, but she couldn't actually ride it. It's like a metaphor for being a filmmaker in a country without cinemas, I think. Um, her new film, which she's currently um, received quite a substantial amount of funding for, is called um, Wider, or Wader, uh, and it's about a feisty young girl who tries to fulfill her dream of buying a green bicycle but faces repeated obstacles in a society ruled and governed by and for men. 
Um, she says it's not autobiographical, but it really does sound that way to me. Um, so uh, she won um, uh, an Abu Dhabi Film Commission Award called the, the Shasha Grant, uh, which provided her $100,000 in production funding. And she was the, the kind of the winner of that, that competition. The runner-up, interestingly enough, uh, received the consolation prize, which was a trip to Melbourne. Okay, now she's here sort of talking about, in this clip of the interview we just saw, talking about the fact that you need theatres. If you want to have an, in if you really truly want to claim to have an industry, you have to have theatres. There's no, no way around that. The next figure I want to talk about um, really is leaping a substantial number of kilometres in distance, but also in time, number of years in time, is a, a, an interesting figure called Senora Spencer, someone I've done some research on in my life as a film historian. And Senora Spencer was um, working in the film industry in Australia at a time when film was a new technology. So in the way we might think about the internet now, uh, she was grappling with film. And she worked principally in the exhibition side of, of the cinema. Uh, and she became a very, con unwittingly became a very controversial figure. Uh, in 1918, uh, under her real name, which was Mary Cousins, um, she found herself the centre of a massive court case um, in which her capacity con to conduct business independently of her husband was actually put to legal debate. I'll show a photo of her. There she is. Um, an article reporting the case, which was called the Spencer case, put it bluntly asking in bold type, was Senora Spencer merely a blind for her husband? At the time, Spencer was the proprietor of a string of successful movie theatres located in Brisbane, Toowoomba and Newcastle. The case was fought out with massive publicity by, a, and I'm quoting here from a newspaper article, a stupendous array of lawyers, including no less than four King's counsels, and was, as I said, prominently reported in media at the time. Given these circumstances, most film historians, I think, would be inclined to try and determine the extent to which her husband, uh, a very famous figure in Australian film history, a very controversial figure called Spencer Cousins, whether he was a silent engineer in his wife's career, rather than what I would like to do, which is actually think about what was the suppressed or hidden participation that Senora Spencer had in her husband's career, the exact reverse question. To what extent was she actually propping him up, not the other way around, uh, which was the, the problem that the court set out to resolve. Um, they're a very colourful couple. Um, she achieved notoriety right at the turn of the century, in about 1906, so cinema was only 10 years old, um, as the only lady cinematograph artist in the world. Um, and the reason they're called artists is, again, something that we might now see some resonance with in terms of internet technologies, but which in relation to film we don't often think about. But when you were an exhibitor in the very, very early days of the cinema, you were an artist in the sense that you actually actively re-edited films before you presented them to the audience. You weren't just a passive conduit of content. You sat down and you recut for what you presume to be the taste of your audience. Um, so, uh, and I'll quote from an article at the time, any unnecessary padding is at once cut out and without in any way upsetting the plot depicted, the duration of the subjects is modified so that they fit with the orchestral program. They rewrote scenes, they developed appropriate mechanical effects to accompany the screening, and each subject was rehearsed many times before it was ready for final exhibition upon the screen. So this is a much more active sense of being a film exhibitor than we might actually understand today when you go to the multiplex and someone presses a button and you just sit and watch it whether it's in focus or not. Um, it's very, very different. Um, the artistry is further extended in her work uh, to her sense, the sense of her work as a projectionist. And, and again, this article that I'm reading from that um, remarks upon her as a, a very unusual figure says that her husband contends, quote, a lady operator has the delicate touch necessary to make each operation a success. And she knows exactly how to apply the light and shade, the celerity or the slowest movement. In fact, the entire success of the entertainment is due to her efforts. Now, you also need to understand that projectors in these days were hand-wound. Hand 
So you would speed them up if you needed fast action and slow them down if you wanted to sort of keep... It, it, it did require a little bit of artistry. Um, the article also declares that they have succeeded in eliminating flicker in their shows, which was the result of long years of study on part of both of them. And again, um, this is more significant than it might seem nowadays, but flicker was... Um, the bane of most audiences' lives in that very, very early history of cinema. And if you could eliminate it, it gave you enormous commercial advantage. And you eliminated it through being able to very steadily crank the projector. Um, the Spencer's exhibition activities were noted by film historians for being instrumental in making cinema attractive to Australian middle class, with ambitious musical and special effects and lavish theatres, and no doubt the presence of a lady operator. Um, Many historians have claimed that, the, that her presence was simply a gimmick on the part of her husband. Um, however, if you read the contemporary evidence and the interviews with her at the time, I would actually suggest that she was actually much more intensively involved in the business than those later historians concede, and that her profile in the media, promoting her profile in the media was an activity which benefited both of them. Um, and I don't think you can just simply say it was about benefiting him. So we come to the court case. This is what the 1918 court case focused on. Around 1911, cousin Spencer, Senora Spencer's husband, placed his various film businesses in the hands of a public company. Much uh, to his own um, dismay, he went overseas on a holiday and uh, the shareholders voted him off as a director and a shareholder and he lost control of the company. And the company was then subsequently sold to a somewhat evil organisation which um, film historians in Australia, whenever you say this, have to go like this, um, which is the Combine. <laughs> the Combine were these... Um, uh, it was kind of a, an, a conglomeration of film businesses that decided not to pr produce films locally in Australia and to only import them from overseas. And this is why they have such a terrible reputation. Um, and it kind of goes against his philosophy because he actually really wanted to make films. So you can imagine how devastated he was by these developments. In, um, in having his, um, being knocked off as a director and then having to sell his shareholding, he signed an agreement. And in that agreement, he, he said, or he made a legal undertaking that he would not at any time within 10 years from the date of the agreement, quote, either solely or jointly with or as manager or agent for any other personal company, permit his name to be used in connection with any picture show business in the Commonwealth. Um, so when Senora Spencer began running, began running cinemas, whilst he was unemployed, uh, it was claimed by the Combine that, in fact, she was running them as a front for him, uh, hence the court case. Um, it was alleged that Senora Spencer had, quote, without justification participated in breaches of the agreement by erecting moving picture shows in Brisbane and Newcastle. Specifically, the affidavit alleged that cousin Spencer, her husband, had purported to act on his wife's behalf when in reality he was in fact the sole proprietor and that they were only ostensibly operated by Senora Spencer. Spencer Cousins went to town on this, employed a number of um, very senior legal counsels, um, absolutely um, defended his wife's right to run cinemas. Um, however, the courts um, decided to pursue one particular aspect of the suit, which was that the male defendant permitted his wife, the female defendant, to use the name of Spencer. So had she only changed her name, she might have got away with it. Um, but she used the name Spencer and, and was therefore seen to be trading off the goodwill of the previous company. Um, what they did in the end is um, there were two days of legal debate. Um, and in the end, they settled out of court, um, which means we've never got to the bottom of whether women can run a cinema or not, <laughs> legally, in Australia. Um, and the story has a kind of very odd ending because they decided then to leave Australia altogether and go to Canada, um, having had such a disappointing experience here. Uh, and he became a, a large ranch owner in Canada. And in about 1930-ish, I've got the date somewhere. Yes, 19, 10th of September, 1930. Um, Spencer Cousins went mad, turned a rifle on two of his employees, killed one of them before running into the surrounding countryside with a number of troopers and a posse of civilians in pursuit, uh, and then jumped into the local river and drowned. <laughs> she remarried. <laughs> <laughs> and herself had an interesting death. Um, she had the flu and the doctor came to visit her one night and went upstairs to check on her and she didn't seem very good. And he came downstairs to talk to her new husband and promptly dropped dead. 
uh, and the new husband then had to deal with having a dead doctor at his feet. <laughs> did that and then ran back upstairs to check on his wife and she died as well. So that's the, the interesting story of Senora Spencer. Someone should make a film out of that. Okay, um, now we're talking about someone, uh, Senora Spencer, who worked on the exhibition side of the industry. So, so far we've had a look at someone who's a filmmaker in a country without cinemas, someone who's trying to run cinemas but isn't actually allowed to do it. Um, now we get to someone who's trying to actually distribute films in a country that not only doesn't have cinemas, it doesn't have films, it doesn't have the internet, it doesn't have a lot of stuff, and that's North Korea. A quite remarkable place. So um, what I want to do is show you the clip, a clip from a movie made by an expatriate North Korean journalist, um, a woman. Um, who um, is going to talk you through two things. Firstly, she's going to interview someone who has recently escaped from North Korea and in doing so tells the story of what motivated her to do that, which I think you'll find quite surprising. Um, and then um, there's a second clip from the same documentary. I've just kind of skipped it forward a little bit, uh, where the documentary filmmaker then tries to meet up with a film distributor who's smuggling clandestine films into North Korea. That um, clip comes from a documentary by Kim jong Yun called Dispatches Undercover in the Secret State. And I'll give you the, the URL for it later if you want to have a look at it. But it's, um, it's full of uh, extraordinary uh, secret footage shot from within North Korea, which um, th those people taking that footage take their lives into their hands, but so do the distributors. And I guess that's what I wanted to, to point out um, at this point in time. These are not necessarily distributors trying to take footage out of North Korea. They're just bringing in soap operas into North Korea. But this is you know, a, a culture in which the government takes total control over all um, moving image um, and other forms of media. Uh, so for example, the government has complete control over all internet connected computers. Up until very, very recently, there was no server inside North Korea. So the only internet access that the elite could have was via servers, um, usually in China. Um, this is quite extraordinary, um, particularly when you consider that North Korea have this philosophy of self-reliance. This is one of the, the kind of major mantras of the government there. Um, it, when it comes to internet technology, the, the notion of self-reliance doesn't apply. Um, so they, uh, in order to ensure that there is almost no ac possible activity, you know, internet related activity within the country, they've actually put all their servers out, outside. Um, smuggling is practiced in border areas, as you would have gathered from, from this clip. Um, usually information enters the country through the Chinese border in the form of clandestine CDs and DVDs. Uh, and there is a thriving black market in those parts of, of North Korea. You can use telephones occasionally, like mobile phones, if you try and catch a signal from China. Um, but pretty much all phone contact is monitored by the government. Um, 3G telephones may make some difference. It'll be very interesting to see how the government attempts to control them particularly if you can use your 3G smartphone to pick up internet connections in China. So that that's going to be a, a space to watch. Uh, there are internet cafes. Um, they cost about $8 an hour. The average monthly salary in North Korea is $17. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of how out of reach that is for most people. Um, it's okay to own a computer, but it has to be registered with the local authorities. Um, and most of the, the software that you, that's available is um, pirated from China and it's full of malware and doesn't function and crashes all the time and stuff like that. Um, the North Korean government also does, though, uh, engage in social media as a um, method for trying to promote its message to the outside world. So you, you can find YouTube videos and, and Twitter feeds and so on, um, supposedly um, from North Korea, but these are pretty much all government run. Um, and until the late 1990s, all international phone calls were routed through Beijing or Moscow. Um, so this is a, a very um, difficult place to talk about some of these issues. Uh, I'd show you a, a, a graph like I did for Saudi Arabia on internet usage, but of course there isn't one. <laughs> um, uh, one of the uh, uh, most interesting things is that um, after the, the famines of the 1990s in North Korea, markets grew up. Um, 
and they're all illegal, but of course they're tolerated because it was one of the only ways for food to be distributed during the, the period of the famines. And it's those markets where most of these CDs and DVDs are, are surreptitiously available. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I don't think um, it's impossible to, and as you, as you heard from that interview, it's not impossible for people not it's not impossible for people to see things from outside North Korea, but you do take an enormous risk when you do. Um, so there is a recent report that says not only is foreign media becoming more widely available, I think the word widely there should be used in inverted commas, um, inhibitions on consumption are also declining. You know, people are getting sucked in by their soap operas, they're kind of, s they're being normalised in a way. Um, and there's a certain amount of pressure um, on the security guards and so on around that because, of course, they're also interested in the soap operas. Um, okay, I'm going to finish up with one last example. Um, and I thought, again, just leaping madly from um, a contemporary example to an historical one, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Catherine Duncan, who's an Australian, play somewhat celebrated Australian playwright and activist, um, active in Australia in the, the 30s and 40s. Um, she's one of the few women directors in the post-war period in Australia, film directors. Um, and she made a film about uh, or trying to attract British migrants to Australia, um, in particular women migrants. And so she's made a film called This Is The Life, about the life of typical Australian girls. And I thought you'd kind of like this. Um, I'm sorry I can't put it up on the big screen. It's, it's just going to be taking up a half of the screen rather than the whole screen. Um, but you'll get the gist. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about it, and then um, I'll, I'll wrap up. Oh, there she is. Um, I love how they don't mention that those women earn half of what the guys earn, and once they get married, they're probably going to lose their jobs. And you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting um, pumping up of the conditions for women, um, amongst which, of course, is the right to go to the cinema and to see a film program changing twice a week. Um, and I think that's, that is actually quite pointed. Um, some of you might know that when the minimum wage was being calculated at the turn of the 20th century, um, the calculations included the price of a ticket to the cinema, okay, when they're trying to work out what the minimum wage should be. So Australia has always had this sense of, a, a, if not a right, then at least a, um, a kind of fundamental acknowledgement that going to the cinema is a, a normative behaviour, that's something we should all do. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, Catherine Duncan, who, who made that, um, as I mentioned, was an, a social activist, and you'll see elements of that all the way through. You know, there's the, the stuff about if you play tennis, you'll be playing it with the foreman as well as the manager and the, the, ca the factory hand and, and things like that. So you can see she's tried to weave um, her kind of sense of social activism into what was otherwise a, a kind of fairly typical example of a government-funded documentary or migrant documentary. And those sorts of documentaries, you see them everywhere and, and lots of countries made them because it's, it's often believed that trade or migrants or tourists will follow the film. Uh, and that was, in fact, a quite popular phrase in the 1930s that the Americans put out, trade follows the film, and they would include in their narratives, um, and you see this in, in contemporary American television as well, the latest gadgets or you know, um, nylons, for example, when they were first invented, were included in lots of films, and you'd see elaborate shots of women putting nylons on completely superfluous to the narrative, um, simply uh, to encourage global markets to buy those items, OK? Um, so, you know, here we're selling Australia and our fabulous cinema-going ways to, to young, single British women. Um, and I, I guess that, that sense of the film is it trying to, or being intended to inspire the movement of people from one place to another uh, is quite interesting if you think about it in relation to the previous um, uh, case study that we used, which is that, that idea of people being inspired by South Korean soap operas to get out of North Korea. Um, and then being disappointed when they do, but <laughs> for all the reasons we know, soap operas can, can mislead. Um, who is my father? Um, okay, so Catherine Duncan herself, of course, um, did the exact opposite of what that film suggested, um, and um, a year after this, went to England. Um, and then moved to France and became a quite significant figure in the film archive movement. She became the Secretary General of FIAF, which is the, the big governing, international governing body of film archives, um, and had a, a quite interesting career, um, most of which you can't read about because her participation in that organisation seems to have been historically suppressed. I don't know why. I, haven't, I don't know enough about... 
hello, about um, why that would have happened. But um, I gather it was a fairly turbulent early period for that organisation. Um, so I just want to conclude um, so we can get to, to the, the discussion. Films are made to be seen. I, I think, you know, we forget this, but they are manufactured. Films are manufactured to be distributed to audiences, usually through space. Um, and conversely, audiences travel to see films. For a cinema goer to connect with the screening of a film print at a public venue, several journeys have to take place in time and space. The venue has to exist physically and conceptually as a cinema. Uh, and I think we take that for granted. And I think learning about Saudi Arabia and North Korea for me has been very challenging as places without cinemas because we, we, we automatically know what a cinema is. We recognise them, we recognise them all over the world. Um, so they have to connect physically and conceptually with a venue known as a cinema, um, and that doesn't happen by chance. For a, film, for a cinema to appear at a particular location, there has to have been some prior evaluation of the physical shape and social nature of what a cinema is. Um, there have to be transport options to that destination, and there have to be supporting cultural and business infrastructures to make that, that venue exist. Secondly, that, that operation of the venue, whatever its commercial basis, needs to insert itself into a trajectory of distribution, of film distribution, because films are explicitly manufactured for repeat screening, and it's inscribed in the nature of film that it actually move through space. That is what a film is meant to do. Now, you know, digital distribution does adjust that slightly, um, but until digital distribution is, is embraced and we all have broadband, you know, to the back of the brain, um, it still remains the case that films are manufactured to be moved through space. And finally, cinema goers have to make a decision prior to a screening to submit to the logic of whatever cultural grid you're engaged in that's created those particular developments. You have to travel along a designated route to a, a venue at a preordained time. You show up at the beginning, not the end. You happen to know that. That didn't always happen to be the case, and I think that's quite interesting that we, we take these things for granted. You, there, there were particular ways of showing films where you could turn up at any time, and the films would just be shown on rotation, and you just watch the film until you caught up with where you came in. Um, we don't do that anymore because we have a, a kind of a social compact that says we should all turn up at the same time, which is the beginning. Um, funny that. Um, you operate within the social conventions of a particular public assembled at the venue, and you commit a preset proportion of your personal time to a shared social event whose success is conceived of as much in terms of public order as it is personal satisfaction. What I wanted to do in showing you these different case studies today is to, I guess, spark some thinking um, that it's not just the content of the films that we should concern ourselves with, although that is very important, but occasionally there are other heroines in the story of cinema. And those heroines, the heroines of the dissident histories that I've tried to, to look at today, are also the uncredited businesswomen and activists who act as cultural brokers, navigators, and translators of cinema to local audiences. And I really wanted to kind of give that inflection today as as a, I guess my contribution from my own history as an academic and an activist, as someone involved in film festivals um, and in the, involved in the screening of films. So thank you very much.